There's more people online than here. Well, not no one. You guys are here. And then there, I mean, people are remote and people are here. So we got to keep on doing our thing. You know what I mean? And like, there's some students who just never come to class because they skip all the time. And then there's students who happen to be remote right now. That's okay. So here we are. Um, let me make sure I'm sharing the right screen. New share, desktop to. That's correct. Well, we have 22 in the class, but there are five students who are always remote. Does that make sense? And then there are more students who are remote right now, and some students are coming in. So, yeah, but everything's recorded anyway. Okay, so in the Unit 9 folder in uh, the week for this week, so if you're remote, um, down at the bottom, there's a thing that says, Honors Chemistry Acid Base Notes. And then there's a PH, POH practice. So the Acid Base Notes thing is a PDF of some slides that I'll work through today so you can understand what's going on. Or, I'm sorry, this, is, this goes along with the PDF. This goes along with the slides that I'll go through today. And there are some example problems in, the, in these. So when we get down toward the end, it's problems like, uh, Let's see, this page here, which is like the seventh page and the eighth page. And then, or let's see, yeah, sorry about that. The eighth page and ninth page, seventh. Oh, I see what's going on, because there's like two on a page. Sorry, so on page eight of the document, which has two slides on it, there are some examples of calculating pH and pOH. All right, so uh, today I wanna go over like the basics of acids and bases, the way that they, matter to us in chemistry, ways to measure them, and then quantifying pH and pOH. Like where does pH come from? Like what the value represents. And then we have a lab that we're gonna do tomorrow. And if you're remote, the lab, all the data will be available uh, online and there'll be like videos so you can see like what's going on. Okay, uh, and then at the bottom, there's a thing that says pH, pOH practice. These are practice problems that uh, you can do to see if you're getting good at calculating pH or this thing called pOH and calculating concentrations in molarity of pH and pOH. And you're gonna need a calculator with a, a log or a 10 to the something button to be able to get the problems done right. Okay, so that's where it is in the folder. Anyway, let me switch back to this thing here and let me get to the page we need to. All right, so the uh, guided notes are in the in the folder, but students who are in class, you guys have this as like a physical thing. Um, cool, thanks. Give me two of those. All right, so hold on, let me check something here. Acid base notes. Yeah, okay. So, um, if you have like totally pure water, just straight up water, then we don't say that water is either an acid or base, but it's neutral. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, what's All right. Um, okay, so if you have, sorry about that, I had a call. If you have perfectly pure water, it's neither an acid nor a base. But if you have 
extra hydrogen atoms in the water, then it becomes acidic. And if there's a deficiency of hydrogen atoms in the water, then it's a base. And the way that you get the deficiency of hydrogen atoms is sometimes with an excess of hydroxide. And I'll, I'll describe and show you where that comes from. So uh, one of the things is that water naturally dissociates into hydrogen and hydroxide ions. So you know the formula for water is H2O, but that water naturally can break down into hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. And if you see, if I write H plus and OH minus, this H plus is the hydrogen ion and OH minus is the hydroxide ion. And together on the right-hand side of the reaction, there are two hydrogens and one oxygen. So water is like a covalent compound, but it can break down into uh, hydrogen and hydroxide ions. And because you get these ions that are in water and water naturally breaks down a little bit into hydrogen and hydroxide ions, those charged ions in solution make the solution an electrolyte. So all that an electrolyte is, is a substance, when you put it in the water, forms a solution. Okay, so like, uh, and like the guy that notes and stuff, strong acids and strong bases, they are electrolytes. They can conduct electricity. So the deal is water itself does not conduct electricity. Water itself is a very poor conductor of electricity. In the acid and base lab work that we're gonna do, you're gonna see that. Uh, I'll demonstrate it. Here's an example with uh, a light bulb with some wires that are going down in and the circuit is open, but those wires are sitting in water. The electricity is not conducted from wire to wire if it's pure water. But if you add something into the water that's an electrolyte, it could be a salt. It could be like, uh, like for instance, if you take sodium chloride and you put it in water, it also breaks down into sodium ions and chloride anions. And the presence of those ions in the water allows the water to conduct electricity. And uh, acids and bases occur whenever there's excess hydrogen ions or excess hydroxide ions and the presence of those ions in the water uh, makes the solution a uh, conductor of electricity. And the solvent itself is an electrolyte. So, you know, they say like Gatorade has electrolytes in it. And that's because it has potassium chloride and the potassium and the chloride ions break down into the water and it becomes a conductive solution. Sugar in water, because sugar is covalent, it doesn't break down into ions and it's not the same type of an electrolyte. So sugar water is not electrolytic so much, but ionic compounds, salts, when they dissolve, they're electrolytes. But acids and bases, they're also electrolytes. As acids and bases can conduct electricity. So as a result, you can measure the acidity or basicity of a solution based upon how well it conducts electricity. If a solution conducts electricity really well and it's an acid, then there must be more acid in the water than if there is less acid in the water. Um, acids and bases can also um, interact with indicators. So we use chemical indicators in the lab all the time to tell us whether a solution is an acid or a base. And chemical indicators are usually uh, color indicators. They tell you if um, like something is an acid or is a base and how acidic and how basic it is. And it turns out it's kind of like a real stereotype in pictures. Uh, it's almost like a joke in the world of chemistry. So if you're working in a, in a lab and someone comes in to like take a photograph and they're like, hey, can we get a photograph of you doing your chemistry and like make it look neat and colorful? Sort of like as a meme, people will be like, oh, okay, I'll just dump some phenolphthalein which is a color indicator um, into, an, into an acid or base. It depends on what kind of indicator it is and make some nice colored solution. So oftentimes colored solutions in the laboratory are not, you know, uh, like food coloring, but they are uh, a chemical indicator that tells you whether or not you have an acid or a base present. There are lots of different types of chemical indicators. Well, let's see. Yeah, and sometimes like the color of the skin of fruits or vegetables changes depending upon whether it's 
acid or base. So for instance, when some fruits ripen, you can tell that the fruit is ripening because of a change in color. That's different than with um, bananas. But there are lots of different chemical indicators that change color whenever you get them into, into solutions. One indicator that's really useful is an indicator called universal indicator. Universal indicator uh, appears as different colors, like the different colors of the rainbow, depending upon what the pH is. So pH of three or less with a very strong acid is like a dark red. Then it goes like through the orange to the yellow. pH of seven or neutral is green. And then it goes to like a darker purple. So you can make solutions change color by adding acid or base. And you use the color indicators to help you understand whether or not things are acid or if they're base. In the that uh, acid base notes, there's an example there about uh, some different indicators, methyl orange, litmus paper, and phenolphthalein, and what the range of pH that the color changes is. So methyl orange is an indicator that is red when the pH is less than three, and then it's yellow when the pH is greater than five. Or litmus paper is uh, red when it has a pH of less than five, and blue when it's a pH of uh, greater than eight. So you'll see about how chemical indicators are used to help us in the, see if uh, things are acids or bases in the lab. Some uh, natural indicators include like beet juice can be a natural indicator, but a lot of our indicators are actually uh, organic uh, chemicals that are designed to change color at specific pHs. Radish skin, red cabbage. Uh, this is another sample of like universal indicator and the different colors that you get whenever that indicator solution is added to whatever you're testing. The thing is, once you add the color indicator, you can't take it back out of the solution. So if you're trying to test whether a solution is acid or base, you can't just drop some universal indicator, see that it's blue, and then somehow magically take the blue color out or whatever like that. Another way to measure pH is with uh, pH probes. And uh, pH probes are digital or electronic probes that you can stick into the solution. Here's like uh, some Coca-Cola. Because Coke contains carbon dioxide, it makes carbonic acid. And that carbonic acid lowers the pH to a value less than 7. So here there's a pH probe stuck in some Diet Coke, and it says an ind a pH of 3.12. Electronic probes can give you quantitative values to even like the hundredth on the pH scale. Uh, we use them in oceanography. The fish room, we have an automated monitoring system that measures the pH of the water all the time to be able to make sure that we don't have big swings in pH. And we can adjust for pH with uh, by dosing other chemicals into the water to help keep the pH nice and constant. pH probes are relatively expensive. Uh, the probes cost money, and then you need to interface the probes. Like here, there's a, a standalone meter made by a company called Hatch. We also have pH probes we can plug directly into the probes that we can use to measure like temperature and pressure and all kinds of different things in the lab. So like you use the pressure sensors, those pressure sensors hook up to an interface box. We can hook this pH probes up to an interface box. All right, so in this, uh, in the acid base notes thing, general properties of acids and bases. So here's some different ways that you can tell whether or not things are acidic or they're basic. These are general properties. Things that taste sour to you are usually acidic. A lot of the food you eat, you prefer it to be sour and not bitter. Like the bitter flavor is like this flavor of like soap or bleach. That's kind of weird or disgusting. But a lot of foods are acidic and they might taste sour. The idea, so you don't in the laboratory be like, oh, I wonder if this is acid or not. I'm just going to toss it in my mouth and see. You don't use taste as a as a test in the laboratory but things that taste sour are oftentimes acidic the pro the idea about corrosive is oftentimes uh acids are used to react with metals we studied this earlier in the course like if you take solid magnesium and you react it with a solution of hydrochloric acid then uh you get magnesium chloride uh, magnesium chloride, and you get some hydrogen gas. And I can balance this equation by putting a two in front of the HCl. So to say that it's corrosive, the acid will react with solid metal to produce some kind of a salt or some kind of an ionic compound. Um, acids will eat away at a lot of different metals. We make solutions with metals by reacting acids with them. 
but the presence of acids with uh, metals can cause them to corrode. And they're also corrosive to organic tissue. So like spilling a strong acid on your skin can be very dangerous. So this idea about reacting strongly with metals producing hydrogen is the same idea of its cro corrosivity. The corrosiveness of a metal could be with, or corrosiveness of an acid could be with a metal, but it could also be non-metal. There are two basic, or two regular kinds of litmus paper that we use. There's blue litmus paper and red litmus paper. And it turns out that litmus itself can change from red to blue. But when we make litmus paper, we manufacture blue litmus paper. And then when you put an acid against blue litmus paper, it'll turn red. In the lab, you're going to do that. So you take like, uh, litmus paper is just like a little strip of paper. It starts out blue. So you just have like a blue strip of paper. And then you can take uh, and dip it in some solution that might be an acid. So if you then take and dip that in a solution that happens to be an acid, and then you pull the thing out, then what happens is the paper that was not immersed in the acid will stay blue, but the little bit of paper that you did dip in the acid turns red. The thing about dipping the paper into the acid is that you can contaminate the acid. So another way that we commonly use paper is to take a glass stir rod if you dip the glass stir rod into the acid and then pull it out, you can then dip like a, or, you know, put like a little bit of the liquid on the litmus paper and see if it changes color. Acids have a pH below seven. And, you know, the major thing with naming acids is that they're compounds that have hydrogen as the uh, cation. The one exception to that is the ammonium anion. So, uh, on the ion chart, there was only one polyatomic cation, and that's the ammonium cation. So those are common properties of acids. Common properties of bases. The first one's actually pretty awesome. Bases feel slippery, and it isn't because the base itself is slippery, but your skin contains lipids. Lipids are oils, fats, waxes, and greases. Your skin has oil on and in it, and your skin contains some fat. There's a reaction that takes place. If you take a base and a lipid, this type of reaction is generically called a saponification reaction. And what you make with a base and a lipid is a soap. So if you spill base on your skin and it feels slippery, or if you have some solution that's basic or base and it's on the outside of a beaker and you go to pick it up and it slides out of your hand, it's because you've just made human soap. It's human soap. It's you soap, which is kind of disgusting. There's a way to make soap is you take a strong base and you take an oil or a fat or a wax and you react them and it makes soap. So commonly we don't make soap out of humans because we don't, that's weird. That's not right. That's not how it works. Instead, you take some oil or some fat from either um, traditionally from an animal. It could be beeswax because that's a lipid. It could be uh, oil or oil from a whale. And you react it with a strong base, like lye or some other kind of material that's a base, and that makes a soap. And then soaps are very useful in cleaning. So the reason why bases feel slippery isn't because they're like, they're on their own, they're greasy, or they have a low coefficient of friction. But when you spill a base on your hand and it feels slippery, it's because you've you've made some soap on your hand, and now it's like. Uh, reduce the friction, which is kind of gross. Bases taste bitter. They can also be equally as corrosive. And uh, very only strong bases can react with metals. And then the trick with bases. So here's the, the mental mnemonic that I remember. The word base starts with a B and the letter or the word blue starts with a B. So for litmus paper, blue means base. Red is acid, but blue is for base. So you can start out with a piece of red litmus paper, which we'll use in the lab, which is just like a piece of paper. It starts out red. It has litmus in it. It's, uh, the paper itself is impregnated with chemicals that make it appear to be red. 
but then whenever you put a little bit of base on it, so you spray or dab a little bit of base on the end of the thing, then the paper itself, wherever you touch or dip the paper in, will turn blue. So blue for base. That's the, the mental mnemonic. I mentioned about that phenolphthalein indicator. There's a common type of process that we use to uh, deal with solutions in um, chemistry, and it's a very useful technique in AP chemistry. And that's a process um, called titration. And titration is a method where you start out with a, with a burette with some amount of base. So maybe it's a base like sodium hydroxide. And you want that base to react with something. So maybe you have an Erlenmeyer flask and you're going to add the base to this solution until it has become neutral or turns to um, a basic solution. So the trick is you have a solution here that's clear and colorless. You add a chemical called phenolphthalein and it will remain clear or remain colorless. But as you add base to it, and the solution goes from being neutral to being basic, that solution will change from being colorless to being pink. And it's a nice bright pink color, just like that photograph that I showed you with a phenolphthalein indicator. And it's opposite of acids, because water, if you write water as H2O, can dissociate into hydrogen and hydroxide ions. The two parts of water really are this hydrogen, which is the acid, and the hydroxide, which is the base. And the reason why you can think of water as being neutral is that a water molecule itself, if it dissociates into hydrogen and hydroxide, there's an equal balance of hydrogen and hydroxide. An equal amount of acid and base is still a neutral solution. So if you have excess base, it's a basic solution. If you have excess acid, it's an acidic solution. So in a way, you can also say acid is really hydrogen and bases are really hydroxide. And on the pH scale, it's pH is above seven. All right, that reading I gave you yesterday, and if you weren't here yesterday, it's in the, in the folder. There are two ways to define acids. Uh, one is the Arrhenius definition. This is pronounced Arrhenius, A-R-H-E-N-I-U-S. I'll tell you more about Arrhenius. But uh, the idea is that Arrhenius acids are solutions where there are hydrogen ions in the water. So for instance, if you take, and you got a container with water, so here's just H2O. And if I add, you know, HCl to it, which is a gas, but um, as an ionic, as a gas on its own, but whenever I add it, it ends up to be hydrogen and chloride ions. So by adding HCl to water, I now have a solution that we just write as HClAQ. But the deal is this hydrogen chloride, it dissociates into hydrogen and chlorine ions. So really the HCl, it breaks down into hydrogen ions and chloride ions. You know that in order to write the formula for hydrochloric acid, you always use hydrogen and then you find the ion chlorine. So when you have a solution that is an acid, by this definition, it's because there's excess hydrogen ions. And the more HCl you put in the water, the more hydrogen ions are going to be in the water. Now there's one side story to this. It says hydrogen or hydronium. So you've never seen this before, H3O plus. Because what turns out to happen is that when you put hydrogen ions into water, they actually react with water molecules to make this compound called hydronium. And you can see that hydronium, uh, H3O, is the same as H2O, but with one more hydrogen. So really what takes place is for strong acids, when you put hydrochloric acid into water, and this HCl breaks down into hydrogen and chlorines, these hydrogens go ahead and find waters and make this ion called hydronium. And this is a balanced equation. So for every hydrogen, there is one hydronium. And in some cases, we care to talk about it as hydronium because that's what's actually in the water as compared to just hydrogen. Bases have hydroxide. 
So a common base is sodium hydroxide. And sodium hydroxide, when you put it, sodium hydroxide is a solid. When you put that into water, you get sodium ions and you get hydroxide ions. And as a result of putting the sodium hydroxide in water, you have more hydroxide ions than you initially did. Not all bases have hydroxide ions, but from now on, the general trick is, and you know this about acids, is that acids have hydrogens in them and they end up making hydronium. And a lot of bases are hydro have hydroxide at the end. And this OH minus is an indication that you have a base. So in a way, water is just hydrogen and hydroxide. You got extra hydrogens, it's an acid. You got extra hydroxides, it's a base. That's the general plan. Okay, the other definition is this definition we call the Bronsted-Lowry definition. And by the Bronsted-Lowry definition, we call acids proton donors and bases proton acceptors. So let's break this down a little bit more fundamentally. If you talk about water breaking down into hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions, this hydrogen ion, <clears throat> it's not even a complex thing because the first element on the periodic table is hydrogen. And hydrogen as an atom is just a proton with an electron that orbits it. So a simple hydrogen atom is just an electron and a proton. So what is a hydrogen ion? Well, a hydrogen ion is a hydrogen atom that's missing the electron. So if you have an atom that's made up of a proton and electron, and you get rid of the electron, you pretty much just have a proton. So really, a hydrogen ion, it is just a proton. So to say that an acid is a Bronsted-Lowry acid is to not consider that this hydrogen ion is present in the water but that a hydrogen ion is just a proton and that proton can go with the water to make hydronium. So in this case, instead of writing it as hydrogen plus water making hydronium, really it's just a proton. A proton with a water molecule ends up making H3O plus. And similar, similarly, bases can also be thought of proton acceptors. And the easiest way to think about that is what if you have a hydrogen ion and you have a hydroxide ion? Hydrogen and hydroxide is the same thing as water. So in this sense, a hydroxide ion, because it's negatively charged, is willing to accept reacting with a hydrogen. And a hydroxide ion and a hydrogen ion can get together and make uh, water. Water is neutral. I don't know why I wrote the minus there. So water is very peculiar because it's a covalent compound, but we can also think about it as being um, being an ionic compound because the water molecule itself, although it's covalently bonded, can break down into hydrogens and hydroxides. So everything that's about acids and bases is really talking about how much, hydro how much hydrogen you got or how much hydro hydroxide you got. Okay. Um, there's this general idea of dissociation. So what dissociation means is that when a compound is in water, it breaks down into the ions that make it up. So I've used this example already. HCl breaks down into hydrogen and chlorine. Or maybe you have this base, magnesium hydroxide. Here I identify that this is an acid because it has a hydrogen. And I identify this as a base because it has a hydroxide. When ionic compounds like hydrogen chloride or magnesium hydroxide are put in a solution, they break down into the ions that make them up. And we have a shortcut way to talk about concentration, especially with acids. So uh, you know that you can calculate molarity as the number of moles of solute divided by the volume of solution. And instead of writing, instead of writing the words, the concentration of 
hydrogen ions, what we do is put this ion inside of brackets. So brackets are, uh, you know, they're on a keyboard. It's not parentheses, but the squared off brackets. When you put an ion in solution or an ion inside brackets, that means the concentration of that ion in the unit molarity. So we can say that the concentration of hydrogen ions in water might be like, you know, four molar or something like that. All right, let me see where this thing is. All right, so besides talking about concentrations of acids and bases in the unit molarity, which you now know you can have a shortcut by putting it inside a bracket, we've developed this scale called the um, pH scale. And the pH scale is an unusual scale in that it is not linear. It's a logarithmic scale. What I mean by that is as you go by changes on the pH scale in integer numbers, it doesn't represent an increase that's a linear amount. So what I'm saying there is you can't think of two as being like half as much as four or eight being twice as much as four. Instead, these numbers represent exponents. They tell you about the regular concentration of hydrogen ions in the solution. And on this scale, we know that water, pure water itself, is defined to have a pH of seven. Things that are acidic have a pH less than seven. Things that are basic have a pH greater than seven. So things down here are bases and things up here are acids. And on its own, by definition, water itself has a pH of seven and it is neutral. So you learned about that from uh, that reading yesterday. So let me tell you how that scale ends up working. Whenever you have ions in solution and you have a neutral solution, the numbers of hydrogens and hydroxides are the same. So maybe we have a neutral solution here and you can see that there's like three hydroxides and three hydrogens. As you increase the amount of acid in a solution, the balance of the number of hydrogens and hydroxides starts to get um, unbalanced. So as I go down on this pH scale from seven to six to five to four, see here I've got like more hydrogens and less hydroxides. As I go further down, there's even more hydrogens and less hydroxides. When you get all the way down here, there's all just hydrogens. On the same sense, on the base end, as we increase the concentration of base, there's still hydrogen ions in solution, but there's a whole lot fewer of them and more hydroxides. As you go further along, uh, let's see, where's the last hydrogen? I guess the last hydrogen was over here. As you go further along, there's more hydroxides in solution and less hydrogens. But at pH of seven, you got the same number of hydrogens as hydroxides. So really what you got going on when you make a solution of an acid or base is the, either the number of hydroxides is increasing or the number of uh, hydrogens is increasing. But the scale is nonlinear in the sense that uh, a pH of 14 is not twice as much hydroxide as a pH of 7. In fact, pH of 14 is 10 billion times the concentration of hydroxides than a pH of 7. And similarly, pH of 1 is a billion times more acid concentration than a pH of 7. So I'll show you how the math goes. Here's what it means. You got to know how this formula works. Uh, you learned about logarithms. I don't know, algebra two probably, maybe algebra one. pH means the inverse log of the concentration of hydrogen atoms, hydrogen ions. So the way to read this is this is the inverse base 10 log of uh, hydrogen ion concentration.
This is another way to write it. Not only is pH the inverse log of the hydrogen concentration, but if you want the hydrogen ion concentration, that is 10 to the negative pH power. So for instance, if you have a, a hydrogen ion concentration that's one times 10 to the negative seventh, one times 10 to the negative seventh is the same as just writing 10 to the negative seventh. Hydrogen ion concentration is the same as 10 to the negative of the pH value. So if it's 10 to the negative seventh, this seven is a pH of seven. On the other hand, if you have a value that is where the hydrogen ion concentration is one times 10 to the negative fourth, this negative four is a pH of four. Now, these exponents, 10 to the negative four and 10 to the negative seven, you know that the scientific notation tells you about the number of decimal places. So another way to write one times 10 to the negative seventh is 0 0.000001. 000 but one times 10 to the negative fourth is 0 0.0001. This value here is a thousand times greater than that value there. So if you go from a pH of seven to a pH of four, it's not like a decrease by some amount. It's not half as much acid or something like that. Instead, these exponents tell you how the change in pH happens um, on a logarithmic scale. So 10 to the negative fourth is actually a thousand times more acid than 10 to the negative seven. There's another idea besides pH and that's called pOH. And pOH is the inverse log of the hydroxide concentration. And it turns out that pH plus pOH is always equal to 14. So for instance, if you have a solution where the pH is seven, the pOH is also seven. In other words, the concentration of hydrogen and hydroxide is exactly the same, seven and seven. But if you have a solution where the pH is four, the pOH is 10. pH plus pOH always equals 14. And really what you're showing here is that the concentration of hydrogen is different than the concentration of hydroxide. Just the same as like back here in this little diagram, as you get to things that are more acid or more base, there is some hydrogen and there's a lot less hydroxide, but there's still some of each. And no matter what, um, the value for the concentration of hydrogen and the value for the concentration of hydroxide, those will always add up to be 14. All right, so there's a couple uh, examples. Uh, we'll do that in a different way. On the like the end of that guided notes there, one says, what's the pH of a solution whose hydrogen ion concentration is 10 to the negative 10? This says the hydrogen ion concentration is 10 to the negative 10, one times 10 to the negative 10th. There's two ways to do it. I'm gonna show you how to deal with it on your calculator if it's not an integer value. So, but one way here is it's always true that uh, this value up here happens to be the pH value if that's for hydrogen. So that's a pH of 10. The other thing to do is because pH is equal to the inverse log of the hydrogen concentration, the pH is also equal to negative log of one times 10 to the negative 10. All right, so if you have a uh, graphic calculator or even like a scientific calculator or whatever, Somewhere on there, there's a log button. And on this calculator, if I hit negative, and then I hit log, and then I hit uh, one times 10 to the negative 10, one E negative 10, my calculator just says 10. So on your calculator, you literally just hit negative, hit the log button, and then put in the value one times 10 to the negative 10. And in this case, it just comes out to be 10. Anytime this value out in front of scientific notation is a one, it's just the value that's up here. But if you have a value that is not one out in front, or if the pH is not an even pH, like an integer pH, then you have to use your calculator. So if the pH is seven, or if the pH is six, what else is true is that the 
hydrogen ion concentration is equal to 10 to the negative pH. So if I type, well, on my calculator, it's just 10 to the negative sixth. And because this is just an integer value, it's just 10 to the negative sixth, or you can write it as one times 10 to the negative sixth. How things get a little more complicated is if you have, uh, well, this one's straight up to, wait, oh, I have it on the same, same thing. Okay, so if POH is 11, what else is true is pH plus POH is always equal to 14. So if the POH is 11, then the pH must be whatever 14 minus 11 is, which is three. So POH of 11 is the same as a pH of three. What we're gonna have to practice is, what if you have a pH that's not an integer value? So uh, there's two things to do. The hydrogen concentration, oops, I don't know why that happened. Hydrogen concentration is equal to 10 to the negative pH value. Here, it's 10 to the negative 5.5, but we don't write values in scientific notation like this. It's not really acceptable to write a value that's like one times 10 to the negative 5.5. In scientific notation, the exponent has to always be an integer because it tells you about the order of magnitude. But on your calculator, if you type one times 10 caret negative 5.5, it'll give you some kind of value. And on my calculator, now it says 3.16 times 10 to the negative sixth. This is now a concentration that has an exponent that is uh, an integer value. And what you'll always see is that this integer for the exponent is always within one of whatever the value is for the pH. So in other words, a pH of 5.5 is one times 10 negative fifth, but the concentration is not, it's not okay to report this as the concentration. Instead on your calculator, you can just evaluate the number. You type in on your calculator, one times 10, you can use the caret button one times 10, and then you have like the caret, negative 5.5. When you type that in and you hit enter, your calculator will report a value that is in standard scientific notation, like the 3.16 times 10 to the negative sixth. Um, this though, is the pH. If I want the, or I'm sorry, is the hydroxide concentration. If I want the uh, or the hydrogen concentration, if I want the hydroxide concentration, uh, I think I have that back here. Yeah, we didn't put that in. I don't know. I'll show you how to do that tomorrow and the next day. Tomorrow's Friday, I guess. But um, the hydroxide and the hydronium concentration are the same and the hydroxide and the, I'm sorry, the hydrogen and hydronium concentration have the same meaning. There's a relationship between the, hydro, the hydrogen and the hydroxide concentration. So this is not the hydroxide concentration down here. That's the uh, hydrogen concentration, which turns out to be the same as the hydronium concentration. All right, we'll do uh, a bunch more math and some other exercises and you'll see how the indicators work and we have conductivity meters and pH meters to help you out with understanding how we measure those kind of things. Let's see. Okay, let's see, stop share.